वेलकम टू ऑल आय संहिता जोशी रानडे वेलकम यू टू सेकंड फाउंडेशन डे लेक्चर ऑफ मीमांसा फाउंडेशन फॉर इंडिक स्टडीज मीमांसा कंप्लीट्स 2 इयर्स ऑफ इट्स फाउंडेशन टुडे ऑन 1 मे 2022 मीमांसा इज अ फोरम डेडिकेटेड टू द ऑथेंटिक एंड वेल रिसर्च स्टडी ऑफ इंडिया व्हिच इज फर्मली बेस्ड ऑन इंडिक वैल्यू सिस्टम Mimamsa attempts to provide a Bharatiya alternative to entrenched socio-political, religio-spiritual, and historical realities of India. This is done through well-researched articles, podcasts, interviews, special features, and various <coughs> research activities. For this, a template of four pillar analysis is adopted. These four pillars are Vidyana, Darshan. इतिहास एंड संभाषण वी ऑल्सो हैव गाइडेंस ऑफ अवर मेंटर्स डॉक्टर प्रसाद जोशी सर डॉक्टर मंजूषा गोखले मैम डॉक्टर उत्तरा सहस्र बुद्धे मैम डॉक्टर राधाकृष्णन पिल्लई सर डॉक्टर मोरा जोशी सर एंड श्री पांडुरंग बलकवडे सर इन दिस दे आर कॉन्स्टंटली सपोर्टिंग एंड एनकरेजिंग मी मा सर लास्ट इयर ऑन फर्स्ट मे ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी वन Nimam sir was privileged to have Padma Shri Dr Subhash Kak a computer scientist and renowned indologist as a keynote speaker for first foundation day lecture of Nimam sir he spoke on reclaiming indic studies towards a rooted academic ecosystem for the first foundation day lecture with the immense support of our mentors our distinguished speakers our authors our readers and viewers mimamsa completes 2 years of its foundation and it wishes to expand more with various activities to contribute to credible and authentic discourse on indic studies from on the behalf of mimamsa team i deeply express gratitude towards our speakers and authors for sharing their knowledge and wisdom with us today to mark second foundation day we have with us professor vasant shinde who is internationally renowned archaeologist let me introduce vasant shinde sir first professor shinde has worked as a vice chancellor of deccan college post graduate and research institute deemed university in pune and founding director general at national maritime heritage complex at gandhinagar He is currently working as an adjunct professor at National Institute of Advanced Studies at IIC Bangalore. With research experience of 43 years, specializing in proto history of South Asia, maritime history, as well as field archaeology, he has completed 16 major research projects, which include a vast number of excavations around the country in states like Gujarat, Haryana. मध्य प्रदेश राजस्थान महाराष्ट्र प्रेजेंटली ही हैज बीन डायरेक्टिंग अ वेरी प्रेस्टिजियस इंटरनेशनल रिसर्च प्रोजेक्ट एट लार्जेस्ट हरप्पन साइट ऑफ राखीगढ़ी इन हरप्पन डिस्ट्रिक्ट ऑफ इंडिया सॉरी इन हरियाणा डिस्ट्रिक्ट ऑफ इंडिया ही ऑथर्ड 13 बुक्स 19 एडिटेड बुक्स एंड मोर देन 200 रिसर्च पेपर्स इन नेशनल एंड इंटरनेशनल जर्नल्स ही हैज बीन अवार्डेड अ नंबर ऑफ honors and scholarships from various national and international bodies such as honorary dilek by vikramshila hindi university and 100 most influential vice chancellors by world education congress he is also actively involved in public archaeology and established groups in maharashtra rajasthan haryana to protect cultural heritage of country and generate awareness about the same among people We are indeed fortunate to have Shinde sir to deliver second foundation day lecture. Sir, thank you for accepting our invitation. He will be speaking on the topic, "How Old Is Indian Civilization?" Inferences from archaeological findings. With the breakthrough research on the DNA of Harappan people and exemplary excavations at Rakhigarhi in Haryana, Professor Shinde. paved a new pathway into the antiquity and the heritage of harappan civilization his findings from rakhigarhi threw light 
on the advancement, the technological development, the expansion, and the cultural and civilizational aspects of Harappan settlements. There are indications to suggest that Harappan civilization reflects a prominent continuity in its cultural aspects with present India. So how did Indian civilization, how old is Indian civilization? There are various debates surrounding this, but what do archeological findings tell us? To talk more on this, I now invite Professor Shinde sir. Sir? So thank you very much. Uh, namaste to all. I am extremely happy uh, and uh, honored to be here. First, I would like to congratulate you know, uh, Samita and the group uh, who have initiated this uh, very important foundation. And I was really impressed uh, by the objectives of this foundation. I am also of the view that you know, our history is distorted by mostly the Western and American scholars mainly because you know, uh, they had some maybe vested interest. And secondly, they had no idea about or the background about Indian history and culture. So the you know, Indian history has to be written by those who know about Indian culture and tradition and Indian history. So certainly you know, there are some gaps, there are some distortions you know, which can be corrected uh, if you undertake uh, systematic work on history writing. So uh, I am really happy that, uh, you know, the topic I'm going to speak today uh, is very, very important because we have done a lot of research and, um, you know, the, the finds that we have from, you know, number of sites, they clearly indicate that, you know, most of the developments have happened in Indian subcontinent. Uh, and uh, these developments, right, from the beginning of settled life, then the uh, formation of village culture, the development of urbanization. Now, most of the developments, even the domestication of plant and animal, these developments were done by the indigenous people. Of course, these people had contact with outside world also, right, from the beginning of settled life. And there was a lot of you know, give and take between the Indian people and their contemporaries located outside India or even outside the Harappan region also. So first, you know, before I start, let me tell you that, you know, that in 1920s, maybe 21, 22, you know, the excavation site, two iconic sites, Harappa and Mohanjadaro, they were started almost simultaneously. And on 20th September 1924, uh, the, the director of the excavation, uh, Do, uh, Sir John Marshall, who was also the director general of the Archaeological Center of India, he announced the discovery of the Harappan civilization. And then, you know, the whole world, in fact, awoke because this was the major discovery of the 20th century. You know, the significance of the discovery is not that you know Harappan civilization is contemporary to the Mesopotamian or Egyptian civilization. The most important thing that you know, most of the historians before the discovery of the Harappan civilization, they always thought that there is a big gap in the history of South Asia. And uh, Vincent Smith particularly, when he wrote uh, history on the early part of India, he has clearly mentioned that India jumps from Stone Age to the Stupa period or the Buddhist period. And there's a big gap or you know, what he called as the Vedic night in the history of the country. But this so-called gap was breached at one stroke by the discovery of the Harappan civilization. So that is the most important part of the discovery of the Harappan civilization. And today you know, we are boasting of a continuous history for last two million years, the earliest stone tools discovered in Indian subcontinent that dated to around two million, that is 20 lakhs. So from 20 lakhs till the present, we have a continuous history. And uh, I would say that you know, India is perhaps the unique country in the whole world where you can see such a continuity. And from the Harappan times, of course, you know there is a clear cut you know, uh, continuity in material culture, and you know, various traditions. I always believe that the Harappan culture 
uh, they are the founders of the indian culture because most of the traditions and cultural elements that were introduced by them they have continued till today without any change maybe sometimes the medium has changed but otherwise the concept has not really changed at any stage so i always believe that you know that the foundation of the indian culture lies in the harappan period and you know the harappan civilization has not really emerged suddenly in fact i am going to show you the actual evidence there is a long precedence so actually you now the beginning of the harappan culture goes back to almost 6000 bc now and there is a constant development happening in the culture and at one stage the culture has transformed into urban phase so that you know we have got a very strong evidence in that respect so i am going to show that also but uh, you know this is the significance of the discovery and second important part of the discovery is that when the you know this remains of this very advanced civilizations were uncovered at these two iconic sites harappa and mohenjodaro and you know you know that you know the uh, the excavators were mostly indian but the excavations were directed by the european scholar particularly john marshall and uh, before the discovery of the harappan civilization the europeans uh, particularly the british had come here and they had given the impression to the whole world that you know, we are you know uh, ruling this country mainly because the people here are very you know maybe illiterate and they are maybe barbaric and we want to you know civilize these people but when they discover such a advanced civilization which they did not have that kind of civilization in their own country then there was a big question mark for them because how to justify then that uh, this you know region has such a advanced civilization and the forefathers of indians were so advanced and they also had realized that these forefathers of indians they have contributed immensely to the history of the world not only to the history of the country so then if they say that okay it is fine that you have you know the remains of such advanced civilization but the people who made them this particular civilization they were not indian they came from outside particularly from mesopotamia from the west so that was the theory that propounded and they they fostered the idea of the you know incoming or invading aryans very strongly so this was this is how the you know history was distorted and now you know with the help of scientific data with the help of archaeological data and scientific analysis we have now you know completely you know disproved their hypothesis and now the you know new concept or the new perspective of indian history is emerging i am going to start you know uh, this uh, my powerpoint presentation and uh, with this presentation i am going to show the actual data that you know we have from uh, number of uh, harappan sites that we have excavated so uh, the harappan civilization it is also called the indus culture or indus civilization or indus valley civilization now this is the region mostly the northwest part of indian subcontinent where this particular civilization flourish but uh, this this was also continued to two other nation which flourish mostly in the in parts of iraq which is called mesopotamia and egypt civilization flourish in the uh, in the upper part of the nile river basin so these three civilization which flourish in in asia they were almost contemporary and they had very strong connection with each other mostly the trade contacts and because of that you know a lot of ideas were flowing from one region to another region and these uh, civilizations they had regular exchanges of goods and maybe ideas also the situation before the development of urban phase was different in fact you know we the the research carried out in different parts of uh, parts of uh, indian subcontinent in india and mostly in afghanistan and pakistan now clearly indicates that maybe around 6000 bce uh, 
you know there emerge the elements of the harappan culture and then of course you know there was a gradual growth happening in that and then in the early phase this particular phase before the discovery or before the development of the urban phase now that phase is called the early urban phase and we always consider early harappan as the founders of the harappan civilization in other words the harappan civilization has evolved from the early phase and during the early phase there were a number of different cultural elements different cultures rather we can say we, we identify them as different regional cultures so you can see in this picture you know these are the uh, different regional cultures identified in the northwest part of the indian subcontinent so this was the situation before the development of urbanization around 2500 for 2600 bce and then of course you know around 2500 or 2600 bce there emerged a very very advanced civilization so this civilization as i mentioned that it has got a long precedence it begins from a very modest maybe lifestyle around 6000 bce and from 6000 bc to 2500 or 2600 bce there is a constant development happening and that development has ultimately culminated into the formation of the harappan culture and you know that the harappans had occupied such a large area the area they had they had occupied was something like 2 million square kilometer that is almost you know double the size of present pakistan such a large area was occupied and uh, over this period the intensive and extensive research carried out have uncovered nearly 2000 harappan settlements now you know most of the settlements uh, that we find they are not the you know harappan cities there is a long maybe misconception among the people that every harappan city is a Harap, you know every harappan site is a harappan city that is not the case like today in patna you know, there are large number of villages and there are few cities so that was the situation right during the early, you know during the harappan times so over this area we have discovered nearly 2000 settlements out of which there are five mega cities and in the other picture you can see the location of the mega cities now the site of rakhigadi which is in in the hissa district of haryana now this is the biggest harappan city which is spread over an area of 550 hectare the second biggest is the site of mohenjodaro which is in the sindh province of pakistan it is around 300 hectare the third one is harappa which is also in pakistan in the punjab province of pakistan which is around 180 hectare in size then fourth is the site of dholavira in the kutch part of gujarat in india and recently the unesco has identified dholavira has as the 40th world uh, heritage site in the country and the fifth one is the site of ganwarewala which is again in pakistan in choristan desert of pakistan so these were the you know harappan mega cities then we also have identified roughly you know one and half dozen harappan towns and the rest of the settlements are in different categories there are large number of villages there are harappan ports there are harappan manufacturing centers so these are the different categories that we find and these different settlements they had some kind of symbiotic relation each and every settlement whether it is small or big they were interdependent they they were dependent on each other and that is how you know the system was and that system has you know has continued till, till today but what is important here we always talk about the concept of nation or maybe concept of empire and usually in india it is believed that a concept of empire or nation begins from the mauryan time maybe around 4th century bce or 3rd century bce but uh, now you can see here you know in the earlier upon phase there were number of regional cultures those regional cultures were integrated into a one large unit around 2600 2500 bc so over this area roughly over area of 2 million square kilometer 
we find the formation of a integrated or uniform culture so in a way this is a concept of a nation you know which can, which we visualize so actually if you know this particular evidence is very important because we do not find such kind of uh, you know formation in the early history of any other country so certainly you know i would say that in you know, the concept of nation has evolved from the harappans and this is the concept that has been developed in india and perhaps then the world has borrowed from us and uh, the other thing that you know, when we talk about nation or uh, empire the general belief is that or the impression that we have is that such kind of nations or empires are made by forceful means by conquering regions etc but here in the you know this is a unique example in the entire world where this type of unification or standardization was maintained over such a large area by peaceful means we do not find any evidence of violence during the harappan times at all so this is a really you know exa- you know clear example of the you know how the non violence can be used for the developmental purpose and certainly you know we can learn this from the harappans so this is a big lessons lesson given by the harappans not only to the indians but to the entire world and then of course you know, we have trace in the at the site of rakhigadi and there are number of sites in the in the base in that region now rakhigadi is located in the saraswati basin and this is the site which is located on the bank of drushyadwat river both these rivers saraswati and drushyadwati they have been uh, mentioned in the rigvedic texts and uh, certainly you know this saraswati basin uh, was very very important for the harappans because a large number of sites are found located in the saraswati basin and uh, nearly you know two third of the harappan settlements are located so saraswati basin was very important for the harappans there are number of factors that i am not going to go into detail but uh, the research that we carried out at rakhigadi and other sites now there you know we can identify clearly how the transformation has taken place from a very very simple beginning uh, around 6000 bc to the development of urbanization around 2600 2500 bc so that evidence is very clear at number of sites so this uh the evidence is clear in their material culture and i'm just giving you the example of the uh, ceramic tradition that was initiated by the harappans now what you are seeing here this is the ceramic found in the lower most level this ceramic is you know certainly not a classical ceramic this is handmade made by hand only hand model then it is not uh, you know properly finished it is very crude the surface is you know uneven sometimes there are no you know proper decorations the pottery is not fired properly so this is how the beginning is you know is noticed in fact this is the kind of evidence in, you find in the in the early levels and then of course you know from there in the next level you find that you know pottery is, is changing the color of the pottery is uh, is change then uh, sometimes uh, we also find uh, you know the so the fabric or the raw material that is used that also changes and then of course you know pottery is now you know you know the technology also changed uh, in the second stage the pottery is made on slow turn table and then of course you know now they have started decorating pottery and in the last stage the pottery becomes quite you know what we call as a classical pottery so this pottery is fully made on fast feed it is perfectly fired made from very very fine clay and the technology that is used for making pottery and for firing pottery is very very advanced so this is the kind of evidence we find you know developmental evidence we find at a uh, number of sites in this region similarly in this structural activities also we do see this type of development now what we are seeing in this picture there are you know number of pits you, you are seeing here so these pits there are some small pits there are big pits and there 
you know, maybe not very deep, maybe 15 to 20 centimeter deep, at the most 50 centimeter deep. And we always find them in a cluster. So initially when these type of peats were discovered, it was not easy to identify the function of these peats. But later, you know, after studying the material found in them, it was quite clear that, you know, these are the, what we call as the pit dwellings. These are the circular pit dwellings in a cluster. And maybe in one cluster, we find three or four peats. And the function of each peat, maybe the larger one is used for sleeping or the, you know, living purpose. In one peat, we find fireplace, which, which could be the kitchen of that particular complex. And in some peats, perhaps, you know, storage was uh, used. So this kind of, you know, uh, this kind of evidence is found in the early levels. So this is the evidence we find in the lowermost levels of the Harappan culture. And in the next period, uh, we find that, you know, in the next level, uh, similar, there is a continuity of circular structures. But what we are seeing in this particular picture is a half circular hut. But this circular hut is now located on the ground, not underground. So in the second second phase, the structures are located on the ground. In the third phase, a typical Harappan structure begin to begins to emerge. So now in the third stage, you know, they have started using you know mud bricks and burn bricks for the construction. Also, we find toilets and bathroom located inside the structures. And you know there is a proper you know rectangular or square shape. So now we see the transition from circular huts to the rectangular structures. So this is in the third stage. In the fourth stage, of course, you know there is a modicum of planning. We have excavated part of the settlement site, Farmana, and other sites in that region. And in the fourth place, you can see now that you know the the settlement is located in a linear pattern. Uh, there is a main street structures on both sides. The small street lane by lane now. You know these are this is the concept that is emerging now, and uh, you know a well planned settlement is noticed. This is around maybe 27, 2800 BCE, and then of course a full place in the fifth phase, a full phase you know town or urban uh, maybe features you know begin to appear. So this, you can see, these are the remains from the site of uh, Mohanjadoro, which is excavated on a very large scale. So this is how the Harappan you know, urbanization or Harappan cities have emerged. So as I mentioned that, you know, there's a long precedence, a long history before the emergence of the uh, urbanization in the Indian subcontinent. So most of, as I mentioned that, you know, most of the developments, the evidence clearly indicate that they were you know, done by the indigenous people. And there is always, you know, there is trial and error uh, method that, you know, people have adopted. And this is how, you know, they have learned on their own and they have reached to this particular status and so at some point. Then, you know, most of the Harappan cities, of course, you know, they're very, very well planned. We don't find these type of well planned cities even in Mesopotamia and also Egypt. There we do find a lot of, you know, big, monumental architecture like pyramids or ziggurats or life size images, very rich, the royal tombs found there. But here, you know, Harappans have cared for the common people. So whatever wealth was generated by the Harappans, that was used for creating these type of very well planned and hygienic cities. And we have the actual evidence at number of sites. So even at Dolavira, you can see that the you know, cities had fortification wall, there are divisions, sometimes it is divided into two parts. It is called, you know, upper town and lower town, or it is called citadel and lower town. Sometimes it has divided in three parts, upper town, middle town, and lower town. So, and each division was strongly fortified. So we do find this type of evidence at number of urban cities. Here you can see the part of the fortification wall at the site of Dolavira. Harappans have used uh, different kinds of building material. Wherever stone is available, that is used for the construction. For example, at the site of Dolavira, stone is easily available. So this was used as a building material there. In Harappa, Mohanjalo, Rakigadi, stone is not available. So their people, Harappan people have made 
mud bricks and burn bricks for the construction so this is you know the kind of you know evidence that we find at number of sites and here you can see the concept of the main street part of the main streets running north south and east west direction that has been excavated and you can see beautifully when planned cities during the harappan times and you always believe that you know the concept of maybe bathing platforms or bathrooms or toilets has come from outside maybe from the west that is not the case here you can you are seeing the you know the remains of a bathroom at one harappan site called kalibanga in rajasthan so this is found in one of the structures and what is important that you know harappans have also made tiles terracotta tiles and these tiles are beautifully decorated so the modern you know bathroom concept has emerged from the ancient bathroom system and even today you know we are using you know the tiles in the bathroom so that concept the decorated tiles that we used today that concept is very very old in indian subcontinent probably you know this has emerged in in the indian subcontinent and then began to spread this knowledge began to spread in different parts of the world then we as i say that we always thought that the commod system has come from the west but you can see here the earliest evidence of commod i uh, excavated at the site of harappa so this concept the concept of commod is definitely uh, you know developed by the indians and we have the actual evidence which is dated to around 2500 bce and as I, as i mentioned that you know there is a lot of continuity so here you can see this is one toilet you know this is a toilet in one of the structures and by the side of the commod you can see a big pot and in that big pot you can see a small lota so this even today in our toilets we do keep you know maybe bucket or maybe jar and we also keep a mug or lota in that so you know that concept developed by the harappans has continued till today but what is important here that you know the commod system the earliest evidence of which comes from the indian subcontinent is not the you know concept originated and developed in west this is originated and development developed in fact in the this part of the world then you know the unique feature of the harappan town planning is the you know maybe drainage pattern and uh, certainly you know this harappan city is very 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 clean so harappans have used of course you know uh, the grading system uh, from uh, higher levels to the lower levels and uh, they have used mostly the burn bricks for the construction of the drainage or sanitary system in the harappan cities and here you can see that you know there was a network in fact in each household uh, we find the evidence of toilet and bathroom and uh, there was open uh, drainage attached to bathroom and closed drainage, uh, drainage attached to the toilet so that kind of evidence is found and this is the evidence actually excavated from harappan cities so there is a network of that and then of course you know, this network was connected to the main drainage in the in the city and here you can see the you know the opening of the main drainage at the site of harappa so this opening is found outside the city wall it is not open or spread within the harappan cities so harappans have taken care of that because of this you know the the opening is you know somewhere away from the city and because of this the harappan city is very 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 clean and hygienic and because of that harappan people were very, very 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 healthy people then uh, this uh, other aspect of the town planning or the urbanization by the harappans is that they started the maritime trade uh, outside the indian subcontinent you know there were a number of maybe contemporary cultures in iraq in iran in oman in mesopotamia in egypt so for carrying out the maritime trade they develop the you know dockyard and port and you can see this is the actual dockyard excavated at the site of lothar in gujarat so this is the earliest dockyard of its kind anywhere in the world so that means you know these facilities were developed by the indians 
maybe 5000 years ago and then perhaps you know that you know these were copied by maybe uh, in different regions of the world probably and uh, also the harappans were also pioneers in developing ships and boats so actually you know uh, these are some of the models of uh, the boat or the impression of boat found on the harappan seals so from this it gives impression that perhaps harappan developed two kinds of boat one is the wooden plank boat which has got a flat bottom the upper one you can see here and the other one is a reed boat boat made from thick and long grass and both the ships made of this the wooden plank boats and also the reed boats both of them were used for you know carrying out a long distance trade because in both the boats boats you can see a house and birds and you know that you know you we need both in fact the birds for locating land on the sea and also a house in the sea for the boat for you know uh, for the facilities for the people living or carrying out the activities there so this kind of evidence is found and today even today the same kinds of boats are found but with the flat bottom wooden boats are found even today in the indus you know river so this is a picture of a flat bottom boat which is being plied in fact in the indus river and this photograph i took when i visited the site of mohenjodaro so there is a continuity in many aspects and we can see the continuity in this aspect also then this gives you idea about you know uh, you know with whom the harappans had contact so we do find you now this lot of harappan material in 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 iran we do find lot of harappan material in oman and lot of harappan material in mesopotamia so there is actually evidence archaeological data which clearly indicates the contact with outside world and we have a strong evidence in this respect then the other uh, important part of the harappan town planning is the water management and harvesting we do find you know there are some settlements in the desert part also developed by the harappans for example the site of dholavira so the harappans created a beautiful water harvesting and water harvest and water management system at these cities and here you know you can see the site of dholavira which is located between two rivers intentionally they place this city between two rivers and whenever there is a desert you know maybe Uh, in the desert part when whenever there is a rainfall these rivers get flash floods and what harappans have done they put series of uh, check dams on both and the entire water was diverted inside the settlement they did not allow a drop of water to escape so that indicates you know how carefully the harappans have, have managed the water sources available and you know how these sources were stored by the harappans so inside the settlements what they did they did, they dug underground water tanks of different sizes and shapes and these the diverted water was stored in these type of underground water reservoirs so we do have a lot of these you know number of these reservoirs have been excavated at the site of dholavira and these reservoirs you know we can see you know they are connected by underground water channel system so the tanks are filled one after the other so making sure that you know, there is always fl flowing water available in the harappan cities so this is a you know kind of you know technology or kind of uh, maybe device the harappans develop and because of which the harappans not only sustain but they kept flourishing developing at number of sites so this is a very very important lesson we can learn from harappans the harappans also introduce a very advanced agriculture system and here at the site of kalibanga uh, on the you know in one picture you can see these are the plow furrow marks excavated from this particular site and you can see there are you know some furrow marks which are close to each other and there are some furrow marks in other direction which are maybe apart from each other so in close furrow marks 
they used to grow main crop like wheat and barley and in the uh, furrow marks which are uh, maybe apart from each other there they could grow secondary crop like maybe a horse gram or some oil seeds and you can see exactly the same pattern is found in gujarat rajasthan and even in haryana so you know the agriculture knowledge that was developed 5000 years ago that knowledge has continued and people are harvesting the benefit of this even today so you, here also you can see the continuity the harappan also developed in you know, a number of different crafts you know for example in the develop beautiful jewelry of uh, semi precious stone metal even terracotta and lot of this jewelry was made for domestic market as well as for international market they exported this to oman to you know to persian gulf mesopotamia even beyond mesopotamia to egypt also so they developed technology uh, for this they also develop you know a number of uh, maybe industrial centers where they produce these goods on a very large scale so that you know they can meet the demands not only of the domestic you know people but also of the international people so this is the kind of evidence we find and interesting in you know, most of the craft that was developed by the harappas that has continued till today there are some craftsmen in khambad region even, even in gujarat even today who are making exactly same kind of stone beads by using the harappan technology so there is lot of continuity one can see uh, in many aspects even the you know these are the some of the stone weights from the harappan levels and it is believed that the modern maybe uh, weighing system is derived from the harappan or the ancient weighing system so these are some of the this is a very very important evidence that we find in the harappan levels india has uh, the best gift of india to the world is the yoga science and this yoga science even the science of meditation uh, was developed by the harappans in this picture you can see uh, this terracotta uh, human figure is figure is in different uh, maybe yogic posture and uh, on this seal you can see a yogic uh, you know person in yogic yogic posture and this shows the concept of meditation that was developed by the harappans so a lot of concepts were developed by the harappans even you know the namaste tradition today we have realized the whole world has realized the importance of namaste tradition because of the covid so this tradition was developed by the harappans which is considered to be the most you know fitting or the most you know uh, maybe uh, important way of greeting people and uh, you know this system was developed by the harappans uh, you know the harappans also used to keep uh, pet dogs we have the evidence of that so the concept of pet dogs again started from the harappans we always thought that you know the feeding bottle concept has come from the west but this is the earliest evidence of the feeding bottle found anywhere in the world this is the bottle made of terracotta and this is found at the site of kalibangan so a lot of you know most of the traditions followed not only within south asia but outside south asia they were developed by the harappans so that shows in fact the advancement made by the harappans and that also shows that the harappans or the indians in fact were quite ahead in fact of their time they were thinking they were more pra practical people and all the data that we have collected that points towards that uh, these are some of them of course uh, these are the sites in mesopotamia where we find harappan material indicating you know very very extensive contact with that region then you know finally you know uh, we were wondering as to who were the harappan people there were different hypotheses some say that you know the harappans were local people some scholars say that no they came from outside maybe from mesopotamia dna science ancient dna science at the site of rakigadi you know harappans used to bury dead bodies they had a separate cemetery 
and in the dead body sometimes we find you know burial goods and uh, the quality and the quantity of the burial goods varies from you know, burial to burial may be indicating maybe some kind of maybe social stratification or economic stratification within the harappan times and uh, we excavated nearly 70 burials uh, at prakigadi and we tried dna from that the condition is very very bad it is not good for the preservation of organic matter including dna in the indian subcontinent so with great difficulties of course in spite of all our efforts we could locate the dna in this particular skeletal remain so this is the skeleton of a of a woman harappan woman age around 35 years and in this we found very strong and authentic dna and uh, from the dna clearly indicates we published you know the you know the results of that in shell uh, article shell, shell journal and the title of that was an ancient harappan genome lacks ancestry from stepi pastoralists or iranian farmers because it was always believed that either the so called aryans came from central asia from the stepi region and they initiated maybe agriculture in this part or some scholars thought that you know the iranian farmers came here and they initiated agriculture in this part but that is not true the evidence that we have clearly indicates that maybe around 5000 you know years ago a very distinct south asian ancestry was existing and the beginning of the south and south asian ancestry goes back to almost 10000 bce because you know we have used the you know the genetic chronology for finding out you know the roots of the south asian ancestry and the roots are going back to almost 10000 bce so from 10000 to harappan people there is a continuity in the genetic history and from harappans to the to the till the modern times there is a continuity in the harappan you know, harappan ancestry and we also have examined modern people you know their dna nearly 3000 people were examined for this research and we intentionally included people from different religious groups different caste and creed nearly 150 different groups were identified and we have analyzed that and what is interesting and surprising that you know in most of the people no matter what religion you, you know one is following or no matter what caste or creed one is following in most of the people from andaman nicobar to kashmir and from afghanistan to bengal most of the people are carrying harappan genes so we among us a uh, dominant gene of course is harappan gene which is maybe around 25 to 30 percent and the rest of course is uh, you know maybe mixed in fact we have maybe few percent of iranian genes few percent of maybe african genes like that so because you know people were moving right from the beginning of settled life in different parts there was you know maybe movement of the people because of that a lot of you know mixing was happening but when we have maybe 25 to 30% of gene of a particular maybe uh, maybe uh, maybe branch that means now we are originated from that and we have that harappan gene in us present today and that that is why you know we can say that you now we all of us are the descendants of the harappans so this is very very important evidence that we have found uh, and then of course you know that there is a continuity in the harappan genes till modern times so that kind of evidence you know we have excavated and you know that this research that we carried out this was published in international journal and in is a big organization called the international conference on genomics and they in 2019 they identified nine top breakthrough researches in you know archaeogenomics and this research that we carried out was considered as one of the nine breakthrough researches by this organization in 2019 so that means you now the research that we carried out is identified is recognized by international scientific community so this is the most important and scientific data on the basis of which we can talk about the history of the south asians and we can talk about maybe the composition of the harappan population maybe around 5000 years ago 
so uh, you know uh, we also tried to to reconstruct the facial feature of the harappans uh, this is again the you know research which is carried out for the first time in indian subcontinent and this research was carried out in collaboration with the uh, korean scientists so here you know uh, i'm not going to explain you know the methodology that we adopted but here you can see the facial feature of the harappan boy uh, which is around 18 to 19 years old in the upper part and in the lower picture you, you see a facial feature of the harappan woman which is around 45 years in age so both of them you know have features the the same features have continued till modern times the present haryana people look like exactly like you know harappan people so here you know as i mentioned that you know there is a lot of continuity here also in the maybe complexion or appearance of the uh, harappan people so in the appearance there is a continuity there is a continuity in the agricultural data which i showed in fact from maybe pottery to you know to maybe structures uh, most of the technologies that were used by harappans they continue continue till today and they are found to be more relevant and there are there are continuity in various other aspects then also we find continuity in the genetic history also there are some people who believe that the aryans came from outside they innovated and they killed the you know indian people and they pushed back you know, some people to south india but if that was the case two things would have happened either the genetic history would have been you know discontinued at some stage or a new genetic history would have been introduced which is not happening at any stage we do find continuity in the genetic history for 10000 years or the second thing would have happened that when people came from outside they could have brought with them their material culture material elements which is also not happening at any stage we do find we miss sporadic maybe foreign material but that indicates the trade not that you know these you know maybe cultural elements were introduced here that is not, not the case so considering all this considering the archaeological data genetic data and craniofacial what you know the 3d reconstruction data is called craniofacial clearly indicates that you know, most of the developments you know were done by the you know indigenous people right from the beginning of settled life which goes back to 6500 or 7000 bc the development of villages or village life the development of city life and you know, the even introduction of most of the technologies basic technologies and sciences that they were done by the indigenous people of course as i said that you know, these people had contact with outside world so right from the beginning of settled life we do find you know mixing with different population outside the indian subcontinent also but the dominant gene is the indian gene or the south asian gene which continues till today and most of us are inheriting all the aspects you know cultural elements genetic elements and even the craniofacial you know elements till today so this clearly indicates clearly establishes the fact that the harappans were the harappans were the indigenous indian people and we are the descendants of that thank you very much thank you so much shinde sir the lecture was very revealing and insightful i mean the ppt was so excellent that we actually got the visual tour of the entire harappan uh, the various harappan city and the most importantly we could understand the points of continuity that we do see right now i mean not in terms of town planning uh, or the, the systems of sanitization but also in terms of agricultural and trade related things and most importantly the genetic and the craniofacial uh, evidences that you have shown they were really really revealing for all the viewers of mimamsa also i have two three quick questions for you sir right uh, in the beginning of our lecture you mentioned that the concept of nation uh, is uh, rooted uh, in the harappan cities we have such evidence and uh, we see the integration of various cities from the harappan of the harappan settlements what i yes. do not have any uh, evidences of violence as such can you shed yes. more light on these evidences 
see you know as i showed you that during the early harappan stage which is roughly from 6000 bc to 2600 bc we do have number of uh, you know regional cultures so maybe five or six different regional cultures have been identified like today you now we have maybe marathi culture gujarati culture rajasthani culture like that you know maybe there were different cultures that time and so that is a situation before the development of the urban phase but around 2600 or 2500 bc these regional maybe elements have disappeared and what we see in over such a large area is the uniform material from maybe from the from afghanistan from maybe from uh, iran border down south up to you know maharashtra and from western part of up to makran coast we do have maybe a uniform matter culture or such a large area so that indicates that perhaps you know that maybe unification was happening and that was, that has happened in fact so that is the evidence that we find and you know general belief is that you now these type of unifications happen because of maybe you know forceful means by conquering or defeating but we do not have that kind of evidence in fact the evidence that we have clearly indicate that people harappan people they develop very good maybe relation with the continued population outside the harappan region through the population they got maybe some you know required raw material they had technology with them they produce maybe finished goods and they supply the finished goods to the same people so there was a lot of you know give and take you know between harappans and the non harappan people and then you know they started expanding this beyond indian subcontinent this trade activities particularly so you know that is there of course but at no stage we find any violence neither that is reflected in the burials nor in the tools also we don't find large maybe offensive or defensive tools we have maybe small small carpentry tools etc but not this type of you know this type of evidence in mesopotamia is it egypt we have that kind of evidence very strong evidence about the violence there but not here so on the basis of that and you know then yoga was practiced we have the evidence of that the meditation was you know practice so these are the you know aspects you know which clearly indicate that there is no violence and this type of unification was achieved by the harappans maybe by peaceful means because you know people realize that you know there is always you know maybe we can always uh, you know extract benefit from working together and that is that is what is the important lesson that we see from the harappans that's that's really interesting that's here an intriguing fact also because we uh, we do not uh, find such evidences very uh, often the uh, another question was related to the religious continuity i mean uh, are there any evidences which suggest uh, religious continuity say for example in terms of yes uh, we have the you know we have the evidence of the uh, the pashupati the lord of beast okay. the horn that is found on the maybe harappan seals or harappan pottery okay. and we have also uh, shiva lingas and yoni also found in the harappan devas okay. so the worship of shiva can, is there in fact in, in subcontinent for almost for 5000 years okay. so there is a continuity in that part okay. but what we do not find during the harappan times we do not find any evidence of temples okay. so probably you no know, religion was practiced as a private during the harappan times okay. and gradually you now maybe later you know it was given the you know maybe public status at some stage okay. but harappans have not not done that because we do not find evidence for that okay and any evidence for yagna kundas or anything like that yeah yeah exactly we have a lot of evidence of fire worship okay. uh, sites located in the saraswati basin particularly we have fire you know this uh, yagna kundna or sacrificial altars at rakigadi at also uh, kalibangan both of which are located in the saraswati basin so we have evidence of that there is a mention about you know maybe fire worship in the rigvedic text also so it matches very well with the you know with the description given in the, in the text so we have that evidence also uh, you know even the you know people also buried dead bodies ceremoniously so and you know we do find you know this uh, the evidence of burial goods so probably you know they believed in second life also like we, we do believe today 
So probably no person after death, in fact, you know, he needs all those things you know, which he has used when he was alive in the second life. So those things are buried along with that. So that concept also continues till today. That concept of second birth has not discontinued at any stage in, in Indian subcontinent. So this, all this evidence clearly indicate the continuity for such a long period. And you also mentioned that there was a give and take between uh, Harappan people and people outside Harappan settlements. But do we find any evidences of migration of Harappan people outside Harappan settlements somewhere around Mesopotamian or even in the, uh, in the other parts of India? Uh, we do have in Iran and in Central Asia, there are two sites which we also study along with this. One is called Shari Sokta in Iran. Okay. And the other one is called Gonur in Turkmenistan, in Central Asia. Okay. So both these sites were contributed to the Harappans because excavations carried out there, they revealed some Harappan material there. So that clearly indicated that there was some trade between Harappans and these, you know, maybe settlements, which were contemporary. Uh, also, we studied the, you know, the uh, DNA of the people from both the sites because there also we they found burials. And what we found that you know the DNA is uh, you know their DNA is in their DNA the you know with some elements of Harappan genes also were found. So that means you know that you know people were going there, they were coming here, and then some mixing was happening. So small percentage of Harappan genes found in them clearly indicate that you know Harappans were going that side there there, and they were mixing with the local population. Okay. We don't have you know so far you know because the data that we have is small. So we, at this stage, you know, we have no evidence to indicate, you know, whether their genes are found in the Harappans or not. That is not clear. But Harappan genes are found there. That means, you no know, Harappan started going out there. Okay. And then there was a reciprocal movement happening after that. People after that started coming here. Okay. So we do have evidence of the, you know, movement of the people also. Okay. And can we also find out the period in which that moment was, uh, moment started happening? Yeah, around 2500 BC it began. Yeah. Okay. And then after 2000 BC it increased in fact. Okay. Because you know people then realized the importance of this region. So a lot of people began to you know uh, look at you know this region for maybe more prosperity, more material and all this. And just uh, last question. So you mentioned that we, we, we find burial uh, uh, evidences, uh, I mean, quite uh, burial evidences quite often. But don't we have the practice of giving fire or something like that practice in that period? Uh, practice, practice of cremation. Yeah, uh, cremation. Yeah. Probably it was there. We do not have evidence, direct evidence for that. Okay. But uh, there is one site called Kalibangan in Rajasthan, where you know, uh, you know, much larger part of the cement was excavated by Professor B.B. Lal, who is, you know, he has crossed 100 years and still, still is active. Okay. Yeah. So B.B. Lal found some uh, some pots in the pit. And those pots, which were kept vertical, they contain some ashes. Okay. So probably, you know, these are the ashes of the people who were cremated. That is a guesswork. We do not have direct evidence for that. But it is quite likely that, you know, for example, uh, at the site of Rakhigadi, the cemetery that we have found is roughly maybe uh, four hectare in size. And for a site of a Rakhigadi, there should, there should have been you know, much bigger cemetery. Okay. So that means you know, probably some people were buried, some people were, were, were cremated. That is quite you know possibility. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you for your time. But we do not have direct evidence of the cremation during different times. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, it's a pleasure. I'm so happy that, you know, uh, I thank you for inviting me. And then this is a very good occasion, in fact, to interact. And uh, the common people should know, in fact, you know, what is the kind of research and how this research, new kind of scientific research is changing the perspective of our understanding. That is very important. So here I say that, you now we are not rewriting the history, but we are correcting the history. <laughs> So this is the effort in that direction. Yeah. That's, that's really, uh, that's very true. And we were looking forward to this lecture because the topic has uh, so much 
um, if I may use the word glamour right now. And uh, the important part is to dig into the actual evidences and know what they are and to um, yes. uh, make them uh, accessible for the commoners. That was the uh, intention behind uh, arranging this lecture. And you gave us the elaborate, elaborate uh, tour of this of various Harappan sites. And we are very thankful to uh, you, sir. And for taking, uh, I mean, your valuable time for this lecture and educating us with your research uh, outputs and knowledge. Thank you so much, sir. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much. <laughs> All the best. All yes, the best. Along, yeah, along with this, I would also like to thank our mentors. And uh, I, would, I would also like to thank our viewers for keeping their interest alive in Indic studies. Uh, if you feel that our work is adding to the authentic uh, discourse on Indic studies, Please support our initiative. Nimausa Foundation for Indic Studies is now registered as uh, Section 8 under the Indian Companies Act, and we are non-profit organization registered under this particular act. So you can also you can support us, donate us. The link for support us page is given in the uh, description box. Also, uh, like, share, and uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. And for more such enlightening uh, lectures, do let us know what, what are your interesting topics. And uh, also let us know your comments, feedback in the comments box. And uh, do follow me, Masa, on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn. Thank you once again.